Hope everybody's having a good day. It's a nice sunny day here um, in Saranac Lake. A little snowy this morning, but such is, is April in the Adirondacks. Um, welcome, welcome. We'll give a couple minutes for everybody to hop into the webinar. Um, and as we go, I want you all to think about your favorite invertebrate, your favorite animal without a backbone. We started talking about um, insects on Tuesday, uh, but there are many, many more different invertebrates. Um, so you can start thinking about your favorite kind of invertebrate, and we're going to be, going to be talking about one today. Great. Welcome, everybody. Looks like we've got a good crew already joining. Um, this morning, we're talking all about uh, some of my favorite invertebrates here in the Adirondacks. Um, and before we get going, um, again, I'm Michael, uh, School Programs Coordinator at the Wild Center, uh, practicing social distancing and coming to you uh, from my home um, for another uh, episode of Digital Drop-In to Learning. Uh, so if you're new uh, to Zoom uh, and new to uh, digital drop-ins here, uh, you, there are a couple of things we want to keep in mind with, with the Zoom platform. So if you go to the upper right-hand corner, if you're not already in speaker view, you should just be seeing me. Um, you want to be in speaker view. And then as we go throughout the program today, as we take it to our field correspondent, there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. And to utilize that function, you'll go to the bottom of your screen um, there should be a Q&A with two little speech bubbles above it. Um, at that location, you can find, click it and enter any questions that you have. Um, so my correspondent will be asking some questions of you likely throughout the program. You can throw your answers in there. And then throughout the program, if you have questions about what we're talking about, about the challenge for the day, uh, questions at the end, uh, we'll have a, a chunk of time at the end to answer those questions and then we'll try to answer some throughout the program as well. Great. Uh, so we can go ahead and get started. I have a quick, we're going to start trying to do a quick nature fact um, at the beginning of each of these programs. Um, and my nature fact that I wanted to share with you about our subject for the day, about snails, is that they actually have a bonus part of their shell. Uh, so if you think of snails, and my awesome drawing here, um, they have their, their body, their foot is what that part of their body is called. They've got their shell that they use for protection. And then many species of snails have this extra thing here, this little patch on their foot, which is another piece of shell that they create that they can pull in and seal up um, this section as like a little trap door if they're scared. And that part there is called an operculum. Uh, great science term, a uh, really, really fun um, and interesting uh, adaptive strategy for those snails to have that operculum to seal up their shell for that extra protection. Uh, but we're gonna hear all about snails and some snails that live here in the Adirondacks uh, by talking to our field correspondent, Leanne, here in just a moment. Uh, so I'm going to have Leanne uh, go ahead and turn on her video um, and we'll go ahead and travel over to her to talk again all about snails. So without further ado, Hi. I'll send it over to our naturalist Leanne. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Just like Michael, I am at home trying to practice some good social distancing. But the good news is I'm not all by myself. I have Wilson, a grove snail, who's been keeping me company. So today you're going to get to meet Wilson, learn a little bit more about him, uh, and we're going to be looking at some nature journaling. So let me go ahead and share with you our challenge for today. Nature journaling is one of my favorite things to do. Admittedly, I should spend more time doing it than I have been recently, especially because I'm home and it's beautiful out. I should be getting outside and doing more of it. But nature journaling is really where the intersection of art and science meet. So many scientists utilize nature journaling to help them with their observations. As a part of science, observation is extremely important. So here are a couple of little examples of scientists who have actually utilized nature journaling. So the top picture is from Galileo, and the center is from Darwin. We have Aldo Leopold on the left and Rachel Carson on the right. At least when I'm looking at it, it's probably reversed for you. Uh, but these are just a few notable scientists who nature journaled consistently that help them to make observations and draw connections to things in their surroundings. A lot of scientists are actually artists as well. It's a great way to express yourself and express what you see. So today we're going to be looking at how nature journaling fits in 
with the overall scientific method. Now to bring you back to science class, most of us have probably seen some version of this diagram, learning about the scientific method, which is all about making observations, identifying a problem, researching, making hypotheses, testing, collecting data, drawing conclusions, and then making new observations based on those conclusions. But where the scientific method always starts is with observation. And that is a skill that all of us can work on to hone, our ability to observe our surroundings. Nature journaling, the whole point of it is to make notes and look at things in your surroundings. So it's a great way to get us thinking about how we make observations and how we can also become better scientists. So our nature journaling subject today, this is a picture I took of Wilson. So he is a grove snail. Now grove snails, you can find them here in the Adirondacks. They're not originally native, and I'll, I'll tell you a little more about them later. But he's sleeping right now, actually, in his terrarium. He usually doesn't wake up until about 7, 8 o'clock at night. So I figured I'd take some photos and videos for you to see him, rather than make you wait that late to see him. He likes to sleep during the day when it's really sunny. I can't blame him. So as scientists, we love to classify things. It helps us to organize our thinking and organize different species so that we can draw conclusions about them. Now with the scientific method, uh, we make a lot of observations and hypotheses and that's what helps us build a body of knowledge. So really all science is is a body of knowledge and a method of inquiry. We've talked about that whole method of inquiry uh, with the scientific method, but the body of knowledge is what comes from that. And part of that is our classification system, how we can organize uh, our thinking about organisms. Now we start with kingdom, phylum, class, and it goes farther down all the way to species. For snails, they are in class gastropoda. Uh, but it starts with the kingdom. So Animalia is the kingdom that they're in. And then they're related to mollusks. So that's other shell-like creatures uh, like clams and mussels um, and other creatures that have shells. And then there's class Gastropoda, which has snails and slugs and limpets and some other creatures that a lot of us haven't had a lot of uh, connection with, I guess. But we're going to focus more on snails and slugs today. So gastropoda is kind of a funny word, and it literally translates to stomach foot. Uh, so when you dissect or look at snails, a large part of their body is a stomach. They have a large digestive system. And then the rest of their body, which Michael pointed out at the very beginning here, is their foot, that part that moves them as they're uh, navigating their surroundings. So gastropoda means stomach foot. Uh, so I made this little diagram to think about it. It's kind of gross, but it always makes me laugh. When we think about snails, so snails are these kind of slimy creatures related to slugs. So in this picture here is a slug that I found and I'll tell you about them. Uh, they have, snails have shells and in their ecosystems, one of the great things that they're doing is actually helping to break down food and make it nutrient available for plants and other organisms. So they're not a officially decomposers, uh, not in the way that we think of dermestid beetles um, and some other creatures that are officially scavenge and decompose things. But snails focus on eating vegetation, especially vegetation that's starting to rot just a little bit. They like fungus, uh, leaves, all sorts of fruits and vegetables. Most snails tend to be herbivorous, so they like to eat plant material. Uh, some of them are car carnivorous and they will eat meat, um, but a lot of our native species don't. Slugs are very similar in that regard. They're essentially snails without the shell. Uh, and they tend to eat plant material. But one thing that really blew my mind was when I found this slug here in this photo. So about a year ago, when we were at the Wild Center, I was walking underneath Wild Walk. And if you've ever been to the museum, that's our large uh, treetop canopy walk that you can go on. And I was going to open it up for the day. And I stopped for a second because I saw this little snake on the ground. I was like, huh. But then I double taped when I saw this slug eating it. So I had no idea before that point that slugs would actually eat meat. Uh, the slug didn't chase this snake down. The snake had already passed away, 
but uh, it was able, if you look really closely at where the mouthpiece is, and here I'll kind of highlight it, right here, you can see the little tiny ribs of this snake. It is really efficient. This slug is efficient at eating all the meat within the snake. The important part about this is then when that slug goes to the bathroom, that nutrients goes into the soil so that plants and other or microorganisms can use it to grow. Otherwise, if we didn't have creatures that did this type of thing, there'd just be bodies of dead animals and dead plant matter that wasn't breaking down. And we need to break it down to get that nutrients back into the soil. So that is some of the really important ecological services that snails and slugs do here in the Adirondacks and across the globe. Uh, so that's a really important function for them. The other thing that they serve is kind of the base of the food chain. They're smaller organisms. So a lot of other creatures will want to eat them. Now, if you want to take a couple seconds, think about what creatures might eat a snail or a slug and plop that into the Q&A. Uh, drop in your answers there so we can just see some ideas that you have. I'll give you a second to think about that. What might want to eat a snail and a slug? Admittedly, I probably wouldn't. They're so slimy. Escargot uh, is something you can eat at restaurants, which is essentially snails, and they cook them in butter. Not my preferred food type, but they can be edible, certain species of them. Uh, other creatures really appreciate eating snails and slugs though. Raccoons, foxes, other smaller mammals like minks, river otters would eat snails, uh, birds especially, especially because they have those long beaks that can get in to the snail and pull them out of their shell. Uh, but Michael, when he was mentioning that little extra flap that they have, not all snails, but some of them, uh, to close off the entrance to their shell, that will actually help protect them against birds and things. But birds are smart. They often will take the snail and beat them against a tree or a rock or something hard until they wear them out. Essentially, snails are big muscles, and they're contracting those muscles to keep themselves safe in their shell, but if they get too exhausted, those muscles relax, and it makes it easier for creatures to eat them. Snails serve a really important function as being kind of the bottom of that food chain, becoming a food source for other creatures, as well as making nutrients available in the soil for plants, fungus, and other microorganisms to grow. Now, grove snails, which is what Wilson is, the snail that we're going to be looking at closely today for nature journaling, are really amazingly colored. So the pictures that we have here along the top are all different colors that grove snails can come in. Now, I mentioned earlier that they're not a native species. They originally came from Europe in around the 1800s, uh, moved over to the United States on ships, probably with produce um, and other things like that on the ships, unnoticed. And then, they came here and they were able to start proliferating. Uh, so they do really well here in the Adirondacks, a little bit farther south where it's more farm country and a little bit warmer. And they come in a variety of colors. And that's known as, well, it can be known as polymorphism. So polymorphism is where there's a trait of an organism that is different within the species. We often think about it or see it in coloration, um, especially with the grove snail. If you look at this center snail right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, uh, but this center snail right here is kind of what Wilson looks like. He's a tanner color with this brown lip, but grove snails can be reddish in coloration. They can have banding on their shell, so they can have two bands, up to five different bands of color going around their shell. They can look vastly different from each other. Think about dog species, for instance. Um, when you think about labs, they can be brown and black and yellow and different colors. Same with the grove snail. Now this can actually help them. The snails of the different colors can actually survive better in different parts of their habitat. The banded snails blend in well on the ground and with vegetation. Uh, the lighter colored snails tend to spend more time in trees and up in higher places, blending in with leaves and other parts of the bark. Uh, and that can help them kind of find a niche within their environment just based on having different coloration. Um, all of this information that we have learned about snails throughout history is because of science. It's because of observations that people have made and confirmed time and time again to build that body of knowledge that we can all now enjoy and know more about snails.
So our challenge today is we're gonna create a nature journal on our grove snail, Wilson. So we're gonna watch some observations of Wilson, get a chance to see what he's like as he's moving around. And then we're gonna create a journal entry. For this, I'll show you some of the materials that can come in really helpful. So to nature journal, you really don't need much. The necessary materials are a pen or a pencil and paper. Don't have to go much crazier than that. You can make a really effective observations with just those things. If you want to dress it up and have some fun though, there's a lot of optional materials that you can use. You can use colored pencils, crayons, markers. Uh, you can take photos outside of whatever you're looking at and then put those in your journal later. Watercolor paints are actually some of my favorite. Today with our nature journal, we're going to be using watercolors because I have a lot of fun and you can get a lot of cool different shading with the watercolor paints. Uh, you could use other tools that help you in observing. So when it comes to doing nature journals, beyond just what you need to put in your book and on your paper to help you make those observations, tools can be helpful. Uh, if you're looking at, say, birds, for instance, binoculars would come in really handy if they're at a distance from you. If you're looking at a snail or a small creature on the ground, a magnifying glass can help you see all those little details better. Aside from just making observations about an organism, other great things that you can add into your nature journal are data about your surroundings. Temperature. What is it warm? Is it cold? Use a thermometer to help tell what the temperature is. Looking at wind speed, looking at soil moisture. So if I was to go out and look for snails in the wild, I might want to collect data on how moist the soil is, which could influence where the snails are. Uh, using a watch to record how long your observations are. The more specific you can be in collecting your data, the more inferences you can pull from your nature journaling. It'll help you to constrain your thinking and your looking. Uh, so I encourage, once you really get into this, think about some tools that could be helpful for you when journaling about creatures in the wild. All right, so without further ado, we're gonna meet Wilson. So as I mentioned, he's sleeping right now in his terrarium, but we're going to look at uh, when he's moving, what he's like. When you're getting ready to journal on something in nature, you should be making observations for several minutes. Now the video we're gonna watch is about two and a half. I actually watched Wilson for about six hours one day, most of which he was sleeping admittedly, so it wasn't very intense watching. Uh, and then he did wake up for about 40-ish minutes and move around his enclosure. But when you're doing your own nature journaling, make sure to give yourself a good chunk of time to watch whatever it is that you're gonna be looking at. That way you can make your observations first, come up with a plan, and then execute it in your journal entry. But observation's the key. All right, so let's watch Wilson here. Wait for him to load. Just like Wilson, the internet's slow. <laughs> Here we go. So once you take a moment and just see what you notice about Wilson. And I encourage you drop some of the ideas, the things that you're noticing about him in the Q and A. Let us see what, what you're noticing about him. Maybe to help with your looking, think about what are some of the colors that you're seeing, some of the shapes that you're seeing, the behaviors, how he's moving around his environment. Maybe also consider what the habitat's like. What is his enclosure like? Some things I notice about Wilson is how his tentacles, those eyes move on the top of his head. Uh, if you see those long protrusions coming out, he can actually pull those in and move them telescopically around his body. So that's something I've been noticing as I've been watching him is how much he moves his eyes.
while you're observing things in nature, other good prompts to ask yourself are, what does it remind you of? You know, what is what does Wilson remind you of, of other things in nature, something you've come in contact with? And also, it's a good time to think up questions for yourself. What are things that you wonder about Wilson? About how he's moving or surviving or relates to his habitat? Look at the way that his foot is moving up that wall. Noticing some really cool ripple effects as he was moving up that wall. Thank you all for sharing some of your thoughts and the things that you noticed in the q and I really appreciate you taking that time to look closely. Now, when it comes to nature journaling, that was actually a pretty quick amount of time to watch an organism. Uh, but I wanted to show you him from some different angles so that you could see different parts of his body as he was engaging with his surroundings. So now that we've taken some time to observe our snail and think a little bit more about the snail, have some questions for ourselves, coming up with a game plan is the next part for our nature journal. So when we nature journal, this is my entry uh, that I created. You want to kind of come up with a game plan with yourself of how you want to lay out your entry. Uh, usually I start with where am I going to put my organism on this? And then what are some other features I want to include? So on this one, I included a overall picture of the snail and then how the snail is interacting with this environment and some notes about my observation uh, time period, what the snail looked like, how big the snail was, um, and some of the things that I noticed about their behavior. I'm gonna show you a kind of speeded up version of uh, doing a nature journal entry. Like Wilson, I am pretty slow, especially when it comes to nature journaling. It took me quite a while to develop this one, and I didn't wanna make you sit here for two hours while I was painting. So I made a quick video so that we could look at it kind of over high speed. So let's pop over to that. All right, so here we are. This is the nature journal entry that I ended with. Now we're gonna go kind of step by step through the process. Um, I always start with a pencil because great part about pencils, you have erasers. You can erase any mistakes that you have. So I started by sketching out the general shape of Wilson when he was out of his shell. But then I also found it fascinating with him being inside of his shell. Uh, whenever I go to pick him up, he would hide right back into his shell immediately because to him, I'm a massive giant uh, and that's terrifying to a lot of small creatures. So I wanted to capture that as well. A few tips and tricks. When it comes to utilizing watercolors, which is one of my favorite uh, mediums to work with when it comes to doing art, you always wanna start with your lightest colors first. Uh, it's very easy to add color to your watercolor painting. It is very hard to take color off of your painting. So what I did is I looked at Wilson. And I was trying to look at the colors that I saw. When I saw him, it was kind of lightish green with some yellows and brown hues. So I started with that kind of lightish yellow green on a shell. And then with the body, I noticed it was a little bit yellower than the shell. So I put that base coat down. Once you put your base coat coloration down, then you start building up the colors with darker pigments. Uh, so again, light to dark. When you're trying to make observations, look at where the light is hitting the snail. So when I was watching him, the light was kind of hitting him from the back. So it's making parts of the front of the shell a little bit darker and the body a little darker. So I shaded underneath him and on that underside of the shell to bring out those darker hues. When he's tucked up inside of the shell, uh, he has a lot more even coloration. Uh, the, when you look at his body, it's kind of like a yellowish green along with the shell, uh, but he's all tucked in. And to add detail, I love to use markers. This is an ultra fine tip Sharpie marker. I think it adds a really fun illustrative look. You can add texture and lots of detail with it. And once you're done with your painting portion, and your kind of drawing portion, now comes observation time. 
So I made some observations about body parts on him. And then with the shell, with him tucked up in the shell, I made some observations about how he utilized the shell. He was utilizing it to hide from me. And then how long it took him to reemerge once I set him back down, which is about 40 seconds. Once I set him down, he decided to come out about 40 seconds later um, once he felt that the coast was clear. After I drew both of those things, I started thinking about how our snail interacted with his habitat. Through most of my observation, you know, probably about five of the six hours of watching him, he was actually underground in the soil. So I wanted to showcase how our snail could actually burrow into the soil. So that's what I just painted on the bottom, and you'll get to see it in just a second. Other important things to put on here is the name or the, the type of organism you're looking at. So I put in grow snail, and then the date that you recorded these observations. It's always helpful to record when you did things. So you'll come back years later and be like, oh man, I remember looking at that snail, but when was it? And that can help you to collect more data over time. The last thing I did here was add in a general summary about my observations on the kind of top right corner here about how long I was looking at him, uh, how big Wilson is. So he's about an inch and a half long, about an inch tall, uh, how he interacted and how he behaved in his environment. And then I also added in some details about foods that he enjoys, as well as the amount of time spending under soil, which he spends most of his time under soil. There's a lot on this journal entry. When you do your own journal entries, you don't have to put this much detail in. I just was having a lot of fun and putting down everything that I saw. Uh, there's many, many different ways that you can create a journal entry. This is just one example of how you can go about it. So let's pop back over here. I wanna show you another example of a journal entry. That one of my coworkers created. Oop. Where'd it go? Oh, for some reason it's not showing up. Oh, here we go. Now it's gonna load. All right. Uh, so this is another example of a journal entry from one of my coworkers, Shia, who's in Texas right now doing some social distancing from home. She's one of our fellows and she is an amazing artist. Uh, and this is the journal entry that she did from her backyard, looking at all different types of plants and insects, uh, toads and little tiny beetles as well as a little arachnids. Uh, your journal entries could look at multiple species. You could look at how two organisms interact with each other. Your journal entries could look at the clouds. You could look at the weather. Anything in nature, which is pretty much everything, you can make a journal entry about. Uh, so don't limit your thinking. When you think about how could I make my own journal entry, go crazy. Think about anything you see in your backyard, even if it's a rock. You can make a journal entry about a rock, thinking about the textures and the colors and the shape of it. Uh, there's a lot you can do from your own backyards. And it doesn't even have to be outside. My grove snail is actually inside in a terrarium. And I did observations on that. If you have a pet, this is a great opportunity to observe your pet over a period of time and make some observations about them. Draw them out, add some colors, and add some labeling. Uh, so I hope you had some fun learning about some of the really cool different ways that you can nature journal. If you want to do it yourself, I have some other examples and tips and tricks on our website that you can check out. So that's wildcenter.org backslash digital learning. If you go there, you can watch this video again. It'll be archived. And we have our challenge to create your own nature journal. When you do that, please send it to us because we'd love to see your examples. Uh, it really helps to inspire us to create new and fun things when we see what you all are up to. So at this point, I'd like to ask and see what questions we have from everyone. That's a great opportunity for us to answer questions you have about snails, you have about the Adirondacks, or about nature journaling. If you want some tips and tricks on different ways to journal in nature, I'd be happy to answer those. Uh, so thank you all again so much for showing your support to the Wild Center and joining us. We really, truly appreciate it. So let's see what we have for questions. And Michael also, if you have some questions, we'll pop in and help answer some too. All right. So the first question I'm seeing is Aiden asking about the brown line on the top of his shell. So great observation. Uh, this brown line, it's actually called a brown lip and grove snails 
their kind of alternative name is the brown lipped snail. It has nothing to do with their lips. It has everything to do with that little lip on the edge of their shell. Uh, so that's what that brown line is. All right. Ah, good question. Uh, so why does it look like the coloration of the shell is scratched off in places? Good observation. On his shell, there is a little section there where it's a little bit scratched off. That can happen just like uh, your own nails sometimes will get scratched and look a little bit dull if you run them into a rock. Uh, they can peel and they can shed just a little bit. So sometimes it'll look scratched, but he's perfectly healthy um, and it's absolutely normal to find in nature too. Uh, wondering why I call him Wilson. Uh, twofold, I just think it's a fun name, but also I'm a big Tom Hanks fan. Uh, and now that I'm, you know, home a lot and spending a lot of time alone, Wilson has become my new volleyball friend, uh, kind of like in Castaway. So a little bit of a, a double humor joke on that as well. <laughs> All right. Wondering how fast Wilson moves. Well, He's not exactly the speediest creature in the world. I don't have a miles per hour speed on him. Uh, the video that you saw of him moving up the tank or the side of his enclosure was real time, so that wasn't sped up. So he'll probably do, he could probably move about 10 inches in a period of like 15, 20 seconds or so, uh, depending. You know, when he really is motivated, he can move pretty quickly up there, but by no means are snails fast creatures, um, especially land snails. And kind of building on that, Colton's wondering why are snails so slow? Good question. So part of the reason they're so slow, if you look at their foot, you know, the little foot that they have, the way that that moves is they kind of contract parts of it and release parts of it. So it kind of creates like these little waves is actually kind of how their foot is moving. And that's how they kind of slowly inch themselves over their surroundings. Versus us, where we have legs, two long legs, you can take a step and cover a full distance. His body is pretty much always in contact with the ground, which creates a lot of resistance. And in order to move that foot, he has to contract and release little muscles, muscles all along his body kind of creating a little wave motion. Uh, so the way he moves is very different, uh, but it actually causes them to move a lot slower. They can't take big steps like we can. But there is something to be, something to be said about slow and steady kind of wins the race. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be slow. If you're moving slowly, a lot of times creatures in nature have a harder time seeing you versus if you move super quick, it's going to go in the periphery of their vision and they'll see that movement. If you're moving really slow and stealthily, it doesn't pick up as quickly uh, to other creatures. So that can be really helpful. Uh, how long have I had Wilson? So Wilson actually came from the Wild Center. Uh, he was a part of our larger grove snail collection that we have. And when we uh, were all being asked to start to stay home, to social distance, to keep ourselves safe and help keep the community safe, uh, the Wild Center let me bring home him uh, to use for programs. So he'll return back to the Wild Center uh, once we can start going back to the museum. But he's taking a little field trip off site to hang out with me for a little while and keep me company. So that's probably been now about a month uh, that he's been hanging out with me. He's been at the Wild Center now probably, and I'll have to confirm with animal care, I'm going to estimate about a year, year and a half uh, he's been with the museum. Ooh, Ella wants to know, how do snails dig? That's a really cool question. And I've been able to watch them a little bit. So they actually will use their head. So they'll have their shell, they'll be on the, use my picture here as a prop. They'll be sitting on top of the soil and then they'll use their head and start to push their head into the soil and then they kind of move it back and forth. You know, like in a back and forth motion to help loosen up the soil so that then they can pull their body down using that foot to get their shell underneath the soil. Now they can't do this in really, really compacted soils. So if you had a driveway, for instance, that was dirt that you drove over consistently and it was really, really dense, they probably wouldn't be strong enough to get through that. Uh, but the soil in a garden 
which is really nice and loose or in a forest floor, uh, which has all those roots moving through it, which keep it really aerated and fluffy fluffy as soil can be, uh, allows space for them to move that soil and then get their body underneath it. I've watched him dig about, I want to say he's about three and a half, four inches of soil in there. I've seen him go all the way down to the bottom of that soil level. So they can dig quite a ways. Um, I'm not sure how much farther they go, but in the winter time, my guess is they're going to probably go several feet under that soil to help protect them from frost um, and other parts of the environment. So they use their head and their whole body to help them move the soil around. Um, so wondering, here we go, where's the next one? How do grove snails communicate? That is a really fascinating question. So they can communicate in a couple of different ways. Um, some of it is through, you know, vision, being able to see each other. They don't have the best eyesight like we do, but you did notice that his tentacles on the top of his head, where the eyeballs were, those can move around quite a bit, and they definitely pick up on light and movement. If I go to move quickly towards the snail, those pop right back into his head, and he hides. Uh, so they can pick up on light and motion. They can also communicate through their slime trails. So they're kind of gross and slimy. And as they're moving around on the ground, uh, they can sense that slime trail with their lower tentacles, which are these right here, if you can see them. Uh, you may have noticed them on his face, this kind of little tiny lower tentacles coming out by his mouth. They can use those to kind of smell and sense their surroundings. So the smell would probably be one of the better ways that they communicate with each other, kind of sensing the other snails around them through that kind of touch and smell um, of those body parts, the tentacles on their body. Uh, they don't, and I haven't heard, uh, to the best of my knowledge, make a lot of noises. They don't really vocalize. I haven't heard any noises. Doesn't mean that they might not make some kind of noise in a way, uh, but they don't really vocalize, not like uh, mammals would vocalize or birds would sing songs. They don't communicate really in that way. Ooh, wondering evolutionarily, so Lucy wants to know, uh, did the snail evolve from the slug? with added protection of the shell, or did the slug evolve from the snail, ditching the shell for speed? That is a really great question. Now, when it comes to evolution, I can hop it's in very on complex. That one if you want. Yeah, and Michael, yeah, feel free if you want to pop in on that one. Let me see if I get my video up. I can hear you. Oh, I can see you too. Hey. Hi, everybody. Um, there's some awesome questions I've been digging through as Leanne's been going through them. Uh, as far as snails and slugs, that is a fantastic question, Lucy. Um, it seems as though snails evolve first, um, so they evolve to have that protection from that shell on their body. Uh, but as time went on, slugs are an offshoot of snails, um, is effectively evolving away or, or removing that adaptation of that protection to um, be able to maneuver a little bit better through smaller spaces if you don't have that giant backpack of a shell on. Um, it can allow them to get into smaller um, parts in their habitat, and it allows them to go a little bit more quickly. Uh, so while going twice as fast as a snail may not seem like much, it can be enough to get them away from predators and hiding into those smaller spaces rather than relying on carrying around that shell, that protection with them. Awesome. I'll Thank you, back. Michael for hopping in there. Michael also super loves snails, so he's got lots of great knowledge about them, uh, which is always super helpful. Uh, next question is wondering, what is snail slime? So snail slime, picture it as mucus, kind of like the stuff that comes out of your nose when you're sick, you know, those really slimy type boogers. Uh, it's a mucus that comes out of their body that helps to keep them moist. So snails, they have really permeable skin, meaning water can move in and out of it very easily. If too much water gets out of their body, they can kind of shrivel up in a way, think about a plant that doesn't have enough water, kind of shrivels in a way. They need a lot of water uh, to function. So if they get too dry, that can be really detrimental to their health. So this mucus, it's kind of mucusy slime, helps protect their body uh, from drying out. It also helps them to adhere to surfaces and climb. So when you're watching them on that video, moving up the tank, you may have noticed that there's kind of a slight little bit of a slime trail behind them. That slime, that sticky substance, 
helps them to stick to surfaces. Uh, and it's actually helped to influence some of the different products that we have out today, thinking about different adherents that there are, different tapes and glues and things like that. Uh, some of that was inspired from snail slime. The physical compound that it is, the chemical compound that it is, I do not know off the top of my head and is something that we can look into and get back to you on, uh, but it's a, essentially a mucus that comes out of their body, helps them to move, and stay hydrated. Um, so great question about snail slime. Uh, do snails have hearts? They do have a circulatory system and, and kind of a heart. It's not the same as ours. It's not a big four chamber heart. It's very different, uh, but they do have a circulatory system in their body. Uh, next question, I'm wondering, do snails have teeth? Actually, they do have teeth-like things. They're not like our teeth, you know, where they grow in two neat rows. Uh, they're very different. It's called a radula, where there's hundreds and hundreds of these little tiny spiky protrusions on their tongue and in their mouth, so that when they go to bite a piece of lettuce, let's just say, uh, they use those really sharp parts to grind down that plant material so that they can ingest it. Kind of how we will like take a bite of an apple, you'll use your teeth to grind it down so you can ingest it. Uh, different shapes, and they, they kind of form a spiky ball around their tongue and in their mouth, uh, but they function very similar to teeth to help them to eat and kind of break down body parts and plants so that they can eat them. Uh, it's a part of the radula. All right. Next question, wondering how do snails defend themselves from birds and other predators? Great question. Their shell really is one of their biggest defenses. Because it's a hard shell, they can hide in it, which can help them, you know, protect themselves from birds and other predators. But the problem is, even though that shell is hard, they're still very small creatures. So if a larger creature, say a fox, who has really strong jaw and mouth, they were to bite onto that shell, they could crack it really easily. Uh, so the shell isn't a perfect defense. It helps with some smaller creatures. It definitely helps them to blend in with their surroundings. But other things that snails do to defend themselves is to actually try to stay hidden. Uh, what they'll do is they'll usually come out when it's closer to dawn and dusk uh, or even throughout the night, depending on the species. So they try to hide themselves through the darkness. When they move, they move slowly, and they often stay in slightly shaded areas, under logs, um, underneath small bushes and rocks and things like that. So they're not, you know, just out in the open. They will be sometimes, but they're often trying to camouflage themselves with their surroundings, which can help as a defense to stay hidden. Um, but no defense is a perfect defense with any creature, even with an awesome hard shell, it's not going to protect them from everything. So it's helpful, but it's not perfect. So wondering how old our, our grove snail is, that can be kind of challenging to tell. So he came to the Wild Center as an adult. Uh, so once they get to their adult stage, it's kind of hard to age them because he's fully grown. He really shouldn't grow anymore at this point. They can live uh, to be, you know, five, six years old. So my guess is based on his size, he'd probably be somewhere between like two and five years old. Uh, when they're first born, they hatch out a little tiny egg and then they develop into these little, I mean, they look like little miniature baby snails. They're adorable. Um, we had some at the Wild Center uh, for a while. We had a couple of the snails that bred together, and then they create these little tiny baby snails, and they grow pretty quickly, probably about two years once they hit maturity, and um, then at that point, it's really hard to age them. So I'm going to guess, best guess, between three and five um, is probably about how old he is. Um, do we feed Wilson other things than lettuce? Absolutely. So lettuce really likes lettuce. Uh, they enjoy leaves a lot. They'll eat sweet potatoes, apples, pears, uh, different types of mushrooms. Try to mix it up for him so it's not the same all the time. Uh, but lettuce seems to be one of his favorites. I think he just really likes the crunchiness of it. Uh, and they would eat a lot of different leaves in the wild. Um, just wondering if Wilson is injured. To the best of my knowledge, no, he's not injured. He didn't come from rehab or anything like that. Uh, so he is fully healthy, adult snail. 
between three and five, I'd say, in age. Uh, how big can they get? So grow snails typically won't get much longer than like an inch and a half to two inches by about an inch to an inch and a half tall. So they're not very large snails, and there's some variety with that. The largest land snail that we know of is the African land snail, which can grow to be about 15 inches long and weigh two pounds, which is huge. I mean, they're like the size of little cats. They're massive snails. Uh, those snails um, are typically found in Africa, uh, and you should look up some pictures, I encourage, after this and just go see how large they are. Wilson will never get that big. He's going to stay pretty small. All right. What would happen if a shell fell off of a snail? So with their shells, their body is physically attached to that shell. Uh, so the the interior, if you were to kind of like take a cross section and look at the inside of the snail, the um, interior of that body is actually physically, like kind of almost glued in a way, attached to that shell. So if the shell did get detached from the snail, it more than likely would pass away. Uh, they really, uh, their body was built inside of it. They grow that shell around themselves. So without it, they wouldn't be able to survive versus like a hermit crab, for instance, will actually go and find shells of other creatures and live in them until they outgrow them and they go find another one. The snail couldn't survive outside of its shell, at least as far as I know. I don't know how far modern medicine has gone uh, with trying to keep snails alive outside of their shells. Can land snails drown? Snails that don't live in water. Great question. Uh, so land snails could potentially drown, I think, uh, if they spent too long in water. Uh, they don't have gills. They don't have a way to breathe underwater. That being said, they're really tolerant to moist areas, uh, but they can't survive in a, in a lake or something like that. We do have freshwater snails that can survive in lakes and other aquatic ecosystems, um, but correct, the land snails uh, would not be able to survive deep under the water. They can move through a shallow puddle though. And Michael, I see you raising your hand. Do you want to add something to that? <laughs> Yes, so land snails would be really well, oh, I, I'm little, let's see if I can get bigger here. Um, so Leanne is exactly right. Snails um, are there, they would be, land snails would be evolved to um, need to be wet or moist, but if they were submerged in water, it may be too much water around them for them to breathe effectively. Um, so they would have very specific conditions that they need and they rely on that, that mucus that, that Leanne was talking about also to help them out with that. Um, I'm going to hop on for another question. We've had a question from Sarah about do snails have ears? Um, snails do not have ears like we do. They don't have the ear that picks up noise and vibrations uh, through the air or whatever. Um, we're feeling those through and they don't have the, the ear canals that would then make meaning of that noise and, and send it to our brain so we could figure out what it is. Instead of having ears proper, uh, they would just feel any vibrations of the habitat around them and that could tell them a little bit about what maybe is out there. If there's a big thump um, and they feel that they would hide in their shell and pull on that operculum to keep themselves nice and safe. Uh, but they wouldn't necessarily hear in the sense that, that, that humans and many other animals can. So many great thank questions. You, Mike. Um, I know. It's so I, fun. I do want to thank you all for your great questions. We can try to maybe do two more. Um, and then I want to make sure you all have time if you'd like to head on over to Lunchtime Live on our Facebook page at noon. Uh, but we'll do two more questions with Leanne and I, uh, and then I had one more, well, I'll just say it now. Um, thank you all for, for attending today, and we look forward to having you come back and, and visit in, the, in future weeks. Next week, uh, I'll give you a hint as to what we're talking about. We'll be talking about um, some sustainability and, and celebrating Earth Week with our digital drop-ins throughout next week. Uh, so with that said, I'll, I'll turn it back to Leanne and see if we can answer just a question or two more for you. Yeah. So I'm, there's still a lot of great questions. So I thank you all so much. Uh, but one question that we have in here is, do snails have a butt? Great question. Uh, not exactly like ours. Uh, it's a little bit different, but they do have to be able to excrete uh, any excrement, so any poo, essentially. And they do have one. It can be in slightly different places on different snails, um, but typically, if we were to, to cut this little guy in half, it'll come out right about here, 
on their shell. Uh, so they have a very large digestive system. So as they eat those food, it comes and it moves through their digestive system and then comes back out almost near their head, which is kind of a weird placement when you think about it. Um, different snails can have slightly different locations of that, but overall that's typically where it would be. Uh, and then another question that we have, let's see. Uh, are sea snails similar in the fact that they have a foot and a shell? Yes. Uh, snee wow, snee snails. Sea snails, say that 10 times fast. Uh, do have shells and they do have a foot. They look very, very similar. Sometimes their shells will actually grow in this really cool, like conical shape, this cool spiral cone shape. Uh, so they have a lot of really interesting characteristics to them, but they share the foot and they share the shell. Uh, so those are some things that they do share with land snails. And then one other question, just wondering how far a snail can travel in one day. Uh, I don't know how how much it's been measured with every single species. So different species will move different amounts, different times of year will influence how far that they move. Typically though, snails stay in a very, very close proximity to where they're born. They are not really long distance travelers. Unless they're picked up by a bird, flown somewhere and accidentally dropped, uh, they're not moving long distances. So probably several feet in a day, um, but they usually are not moving long distance. And Michael, if you have anything to add to that, please do feel welcome. No. I don't have any specifics on the, the land speed of a snail or the, the distance yeah. it can travel. Um, as Leanne mentioned with Wilson, at least, he, he or she or I guess it, snails are hermaphrodites, so they're kind of both, um, yeah. was uh, buried in the, the soil in, in, its, in her terrarium for, for much of the day. Uh, so they wouldn't necessarily, if they didn't need to travel that far, there's no reason for a snail to go on a giant cross land or cross ocean journey. All right. Well, well thank I wanted. You. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Michael. No, go ahead. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, Leanne, for 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 sharing all about Wilson and how to go out in nature journal. I hope you all give it a shot and and do some nature journaling of your own, observing some animals uh, around your home, around your neighborhood. Um, I hope you stay healthy, and I hope to see you all uh, next week. So have a great afternoon, and we'll see you later, everybody.